hope that's set up a few juicy topics for tonight and beyond. And, you know, have a nice conversation with uh, Jody about what else you should have put into the six and a half minute clip. I thought it was helpful to start framing it. So I'm happy, you may be happy to hear that um, you're, you're finished now listening to me and that it's a great pleasure uh, to bring up um, Reverend Jesse Maranda. Jesse. Good evening. Before I uh, introduce our speaker for the evening, let me just uh, give you a little of my story. I uh, grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My father, Catholic. My mother, Methodist. And I turned out Pentecostal. <laughs> Hispanic and Pentecostal, twice a minority. In grade school, when asked what denomination I belong to, my response was, I'm a hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't know anything about being Protestant, Evangelical, or Assemblies of God. But what I did know was that a couple from the church in the barrio, with Bibles in hand, came to the door and asked to pray for my mother, who had been gravely ill for a month from pneumonia. They prayed and I saw with my eyes the healing instantly. This is a church that gave Christmas toys to the children in the neighborhood. Picked up children to go to Sunday school to learn the Bible. Had vacation Bible school that made our summers pretty exciting and created community among us. I was 10 years old when I exhibited the com compulsive drive and brazen uh, audacity of some Pentecostals. Around the table, dinner table one night, I said, uh, Dad, Catholics don't read the Bible. Mom, Methodists read the four Gospels but never get to the book of Acts. And they confessed and admitted my observations were correct, but then they turned around and told me, and Protestants and Pentecostals never go beyond the book of Acts. And they were correct. I was 12 years old when my mother became Pentecostal. I recall in a revival meeting during what we call an altar service, my mother placed her arms around my shoulder and said, Hijo, son, when you grow up, I want you to be an educated man. Then pointed to Joe Martinez, a deacon of the church, the only person we knew in the neighborhood that had a college degree, a college professor in a storefront church in the barrio. He lay stretched out on the floor before God. There, she said, is an educated man. That image of a man with a mind ablaze and a heart on fire has lingered in my mind ever since. It has helped to define my Pentecostal ministry ever since. We are here in a symposium speaking about Pentecostalism. And with some very educated women and men that we have in our presence and we will hear throughout the two days that follow. The dictionary, according to Webster, says that a symposium is a drinking party and convivial discussion. Kimon, that's what it says in Greek. <laughs> and I said, uh oh, that's a wrong way to go. But then again, maybe they are right because Pentecostals like the new wine. The new wine. For sure, we come to discuss Pentecostalism in its broadest sense. The discussions will include the classical as well as a wide range of 
charismatic movements and new churches, perhaps independent. Our intention is to take stock of Pentecostalism. How far has Pentecostalism come at the 100th anniversary of Azusa Street Revival? What is Pentecostal's global significance, implications, and impact in the world today? What are the future directions of the movement? As a Pentecostal practitioner myself, for years I had seen the need for such a forum where there would be the combination of spiritual revival but also scholarly information where we would come together as informed scholars to discuss the relationship between the spiritual and the social dimensions of the Christian commitment. Tonight I see the possibility, possibility beginning for creative, creative reflection on the Pentecostal movement as a source for both spiritual renewal and social liberation. Without the sources uh, presumed necessary for its expansion, what then is the source of Pentecostals' sustained growth, resilience, and versatility? What is the adequate explanation of how the Pentecostal groups continue to advance? Is it the appeal to economic, cultural, and social motives? Is it the Pentecostals' unshakable commitment to missions and its expansionist ideology? Is it its boldly and innovative and pragmatic approach to urban ministry? These are questions that have lingered in my mind and tried to craft, and from my students that perhaps see the need. Is the combination of traditional piety and radical activity, as in the past for social liberation, a possibility in this day and age? Is the integration of a vibrant revivalistic spirituality with a sustained social commitment too far to imagine that could take place? We come with these many questions tonight. We have uh, someone that impersonates a lot of these questions that I have asked in my mind and in the person of a pastor from Guatemala un hermano un amigo Harold Caballeros from Guatemala Harold comes to us he is the founder and senior pastor of El Shaddai Church in Guatemala City I hear about it. I was uh, a week ago in El Salvador. He has many disciples, many admirers in those uh, Central American countries. A former lawyer, Pastor Caballeros, has developed a ministry that has taken him to more than 45 countries. He is a member of Church Growth International of Seoul, Korea, and actively participates in the transformation of his country through the Vision Radio Network, a network that covers the entire country of Guatemala, which is an outreach from his church, El Shaddai Church. Pastor Caballero lives in Guatemala City with his wife, who is here, Cecilia, and their children, Harold, Andrea, and Cristina, and David. Bienvenido, hermano Caballeros. Let us welcome Brother Caballeros from Guatemala City. Thank you very much. Let me just take a minute here and uh, address uh, the people who speak Spanish. Quisiera saludar a los hermanos que hablan castellano, sé que hay muchos de América Latina, sé que hay muchos de El Salvador y aún sé que hay algunos de Guatemala. Buenas noches a todos. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express the gratitude that I have in my heart uh, for the organizers of this event to allow us to be here tonight, Cecilia, my wife and I, are delighted to share with you during this weekend 
and uh, I am thrilled to have the opportunity of uh, speaking tonight to you about the role of Pentecostalism in Guatemala, my country. I will take the liberty of sharing with you some uh, of my personal pilgrimage, if I can call it that way, as I have the idea that uh, I am a product of Pentecostalism in Guatemala and that my life reflects in a sense the way the Lord has used this movement not only in Guatemala but Central and Latin America. Pentecostalism came to Guatemala in 1953 in a mighty way during a crusade of Dr. T.L. Osborne. He came to Guatemala for six weeks as, as it was his custom and he stayed an extra couple of weeks and in those two months the whole country was shaken by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit in the sense of miracles, tongue speaking, baptism of the Holy Spirit and all these signs and wonders that came to literally shake the country. Many leaders became Pentecostals after that visit and the whole church can today refer to a before T.L. Osborne and after T.L. Osborne. In 1960, and I would say and I would argue that it, is, that it was a result of uh, the visit that I just mentioned, a church called El Calvario Calvary, pastored by some Canadian missionaries, especially one who was the pastor at that time, his name is Norman Parish, lived a three-year revival where they hold services every morning and every afternoon and every night for three years and they experienced a great number of conversions and miracles and wonders and the ministry of deliverance started in a very pow powerful way in that church. In 1960, Norman Parish tells me, the Lord delivered a prophecy, and the prophecy was that he had chosen Guatemala to become a lighthouse unto the nations, that Guatemala would become a Christian nation, that Guatemala would become a model for other nations in the world, a Christian nation, a saved nation. When that happened, Pastor Parish says it was very hard to believe it because less than 1% of the population in Guatemala consisted of believers. He said, we received the word, but really there was no faith to believe it. In 1976, the 4th of February, Guatemala experienced a terrible tragedy, an earthquake that killed 27,000 people in three minutes. It was a terrible situation and our conclusion today is that the eyes and the hearts of the people went up to the Lord in that terrible day. Because the gospel had been present for 95 years in Guatemala and the percentage had not gone higher than 1.2 percent of the population. But then right after that earthquake something happened and now in 30 years, Guatemala has gone from 1.2% Christians in the population to 40% today. An amazing growth, an amazing growth curve that now puts Guatemala along the line of South Korea in the number of conversions and in the number of born again believers in the world. Not only that, but 60% of those believers today are Pentecostals. The growth today in the, in the Guatemalan church is located mainly in the Pentecostal or as they call it now Neo-Pentecostal world. In 79, the first day of December of 79, a Saturday, I received the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. I uh, had finished my law degree Graduation was two or three days ahead of me when I met Cecilia. And Cecilia introduced me to the Lord and that's how I got my experience 
my personal experience with Jesus Christ, and that's how I was born again. After being raised in a Catholic family, having attended a Jesuit school, and I was born again in 79. The next Saturday I was baptized in water, and two Saturdays afterwards, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, becoming a Pentecostal, tongue-speaking, born-again believer. Those days, the church I was invited to had a, uh, I guess I can call it a revival, a convention, a conference, and the guest speaker spoke a word of prophecy, saying that Guatemala would be a lighthouse unto the nations of the world saying that Guatemala was chosen by God to become a Christian nation. Those words were imprinted in my heart. Cecilia used to have a friend, classmate. She invited us to her church, and as we visited her church, the same prophetic word came. Different people, same word. I visited the second Sunday, as I just mentioned it, the full gospel businessmen uh, meeting, where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the words of prophecy were exactly the same again. God had chosen our little nation to become a model of Christianity for the nations of the world. My born again experience was marked by those words of prophecy. We started the ministry, we came to Houston, studied the, and then were ordained in the wonderful Lakewood Church pastor in those days by Pastor John Austin. And we came back to Guatemala to start our church called El Shaddai. 23 years ago, we started the ministry. And uh, the whole time, the goal, the objective, the mission, the vision of the church is, as it says in the Spanish Bible, in Revelation 21, 24, to sign up Guatemala in the list of nations that shall be saved. We started this church with very little experience, very little uh, understanding, but a lot of enthusiasm and a vision, a very strong vision. In 1988, in the month of August, Cecilia and I went to visit her parents. They used to have a small living room before the bedroom, and I sat down there, and I just got a hold of a magazine that uh, had come probably that very same day. It was a National Geographic magazine, August 1988. The cover, the Olympic, the Summer Olympic Games of Seoul, Korea. As I opened the magazine, the Lord spoke to my heart because there were two pictures in that page. One picture was black and white. This picture was taken in 1956 or 7. And uh, Seoul, Korea looked very poor, extremely poor. Only one road, but you wouldn't call that a road. It was more like a dirt road. And uh, small houses. You could see the poverty. Underneath that picture, there was a second picture, full color, taken in 1988, only 30 years after the first one. It was obvious that the photographer has, had stood in the very same spot to take the picture to be compared with the first one. The second picture showed a vibrant city full of highways and skyscrapers, buildings, and it was the picture of development. In only 30 years, that brought hope to my heart that this can be achieved in one generation. The dream could be obtained by the church. By the church, I mean the body of Christ in our country. Immediately, I called a gentleman that I had met before by the name of John Hurston, a wonderful man of God, a minister of the Assemblies of God that had started that church with a young Paul Yonggi Cho in 1958. I called Brother John Hurst and I said, I am deeply impressed by the Lord with the example of Seoul, Korea. How can I learn more? How can I go there? What do you suggest? And he said, 
in October every year, there's a big conference in Dr. Cho's church, I guess you have to go. I'll make the arrangements, you travel and you go to Korea, and I will help you get in touch with Dr. Cho. Cecilia and I traveled that to October of 1988, and met Dr. Cho, I not only met him, but met his secretary, Lydia Swain. Sister Swain took us and was so generous to share with you her experience. She told us that she had arrived in Seoul, Korea in 1964, in the month of May, when the heavens had already opened. I mean, this expression was very new for me. What do you mean heavens had opened? She said they were praying so hard since 1958 that five years later, five years after prayer and fasting, the heavens opened and the miraculous became the regular, the normal, the natural in the church. She told us this experience. She said the first Sunday she came to church in May 1964, she sat in the fourth row. The heavens were open, she says. The miracles were normal. So normal that a person who was in second row stood up in the middle of the message while Dr. Cho was preaching. And he exclaimed, I was blind and I can't see. It's a miracle, a miracle. And people told him, shut up. Don't you see? The pastor is preaching. <laughs> miracles have become so normal that people were not scared or surprised anymore. I was very interested to learn what these open heavens meant. She told us one experience after the other, and I learned about the poor state of society in 58, when Dr. Cho told me eight out of every ten men had tuberculosis. He said the trees didn't have any leaves, because if a tree had any kind of leaves, people would take them to make some soup because there was nothing to eat. War had been terrible. Situation was at its worst. And Dr. Cho says, we got a tent. I had seen the pictures. It was not really a tent. It was just a piece of, uh, of uh, cloth used by the U.S. Army during the war. And that's where they started the church. He says... We fasted, but it's, it was not because we were too spiritual. It's because we didn't have anything to eat. <laughs> we prayed, but it was not because we were spiritual. It was the only hope that anyone could have. And in five years, the Lord showed up and started that change process that has taken Seoul, Korea, to have today a church with 700,000 members, 700,000 plus a second church with 460,000, and a third church with 250,000 in the same city. I mean, it's quite amazing. Besides, of course, I don't know, tens or dozens of churches of 30,000, 40,000 plus members. I took a hold of that vision, went back home, and understood in my heart that prayer was the key to victory. Prayer was the key to revival. Prayer was the key to obtain this trilogy, revival, reform, restoration of society. I wanted that. I wanted it so bad for my country. I thought prayer was the end. Prayer was the objective. Prayer is it, I used to say. Along with prayer, I learned about intercession, we became very sophisticated. We learned about prophetic intercession. We learned about spiritual warfare. We learned about spiritual mapping and so on and so forth. It was very exciting. The decade of the 90s was like, a, like an open veil for us. We expected to achieve victory because we had gotten a hold of the key, prayer. As we started 1990, we recruited an army of 30,000 intercessors in Guatemala, all over the country, with a commitment to pray one hour every single day for the nation. It was a very supernatural time. It was an amazing time. Churches were growing, and uh, 
this army of believers that we call Jesus is Lord of Guatemala was impacting the whole nation. It was all over the news, it was all over the country, it was, it was something very vibrant and very strong. But one day, a friend of mine visited, came and said something very simple but quite uh, uh, surprising or, shock, or shocking for a pastor. He asked me, have you seen such and such church? Have you noticed how they are growing? I said, of course. I said, have you heard about this other church in the city? Have you noticed how they are growing? I said, yeah, sure, of course, I have heard of it. And he says, have you seen this other church, a third one, in the city? Have you noticed how it is growing? I said, sure, of course. And he says, how come we pray and we are not growing? Of course, that's one of those nights when a pastor doesn't sleep. I came to the point of realizing that, what, that prayer was not the answer as I thought. Someone in my mind, I had the recollection of hearing Dr. Cho using the phrase organizing for evangelism. I started to seek the Lord, I ended up with a plan to organize for evangelism. And very soon our church was receiving 160 members every single week. And I am not talking about converts, I'm talking about members every single week. I thought evangelism is the key. Prayer was not the key. Prayer was only a way. It was not an end in itself. It was only a way to obtain efficient evangelism. Evangelism is the answer. I was so excited. I thought this is the key. Now we have the key. In 1990, from 1990 to 98, we were very, ha very happy, not only, not only praying and uh, doing intercessory prayer and, and, and growing, but we came to understand the dynamics. In 1998, we celebrated a congress, a world congress in Guatemala, where six or 7,000 people attended. 1,200 of them came from more than 110 nations. It was very exciting. It was a world congress on prayer, spiritual warfare, and evangelism. We brought the greatest evangelists of the time. T.L. Osborne was there, Maurice Arulo was there, Carlos Anacondia was there. I mean, it was fantastic. We thought, we have the key. The name is evangelism. That's why we are here for. During that Congress, a couple of things happened. Number one, George Otis brought a video that was called Transformation. At the very same time, we were promoting a laboratory case, an amazing case, a supernatural case called Almolonga, a very small city in Guatemala, 16, 17,000 people, a very poor city with two main problems, poverty and alcoholism. Not only those, but idolatry and the temple of a particular entity called Mashimon, located in the center of town. This Mashimon entity was uh, an idol that was worshipped uh, since nobody can remember. But then one day, the Holy Spirit comes, Pentecostalism shows up in Almolonga, and the pastors start to pray. One of them receives two cassette tapes and hears for the very first time about the ministry of deliverance. Casting out devils, he said, what is that? Two, three, four nights afterwards, a woman comes to church and says, Pastor, look at me. She was all bruised. Her husband had hit her again. And she says, can you come and pray for my husband? Pastor says, I will not go and pray for your husband because he is very dangerous. She says, my husband is totally drunk and asleep. Asleep, I will go and pray, he says. <laughs> he comes to pray for the man, and at this very second of laying hands and praying, the man wakes up. And with a very strange voice says, I am Mashimu. Pastor had about two seconds to remind the two cassette tapes. And started to deal with the demon in the name of Jesus. Half an hour later, this man was totally delivered, and the faith of this pastor had grown tremendously, 
And the man was absolutely sober. He received the Lord Jesus Christ. Next Saturday he came for baptism. And very soon he came to the pastor's house and said, Can you tell me what happened to me? Pastor explained the best he could. Because he really didn't know much. He explains the best he can. And the man says, You know why I'm asking? Because I have many friends that are now like I was a week ago. Can I bring him over? One by one, they started to be delivered and saved. In a 16 or 17,000 members town, news traveled real fast. The other pastors came and asked, what's happening? He didn't know much. He couldn't, he couldn't explain the theology behind it. He, he really didn't know how to explain. So he says, I guess the best thing we can do is to invite the preacher who preached in these two tapes. So they brought these preachers from El Calvario, the church I, I, I told you about. This happened in 72, 1972. They invited these preachers and between six and seven hundred people were delivered that weekend. After that, a revival started in Almolonga that uh, the priests of the Temple of Mashimon noticed and said, what's happening? Because we are losing power. Eventually, they left town, they left the territory and Almolonga passed from the very, very poor, uh, I would say the poorest, one of the poorest cities in Guatemala, to become today one of the most fertile valleys in the country, producing these amazing carrots that you might have seen. I should have brought a couple, because <laughs> nobody believes until they see them. And Almolonga became a model of transformation. What prayer can do for a city is more that than what we used to think in terms of only conversion. Transformation is more than converts. Transformation means something else. At the very same time, we were facing problems that we are still facing today with violence and crime and poverty and other social maladies that made us think and we came to a conclusion and we said, conversion is not enough. This is where we, where we learn the principle of numbers are not enough. We are missing something. We used a word to understand this and the word of course is discipleship. God never called us to make converts, he called us to make disciples. And we came to understand that transformation has two sides. One which is absolutely personal. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Romans 12 too. And then transformation which is social. When we talk about social transformation, in year 2000 we started to think about these tremendous concepts, like, construct, like social construction of reality. We even ventured to think about construction of social reality. We came to believe that this social construction can be started from a revelation, divine revelation, a prophetic word, very much like the ideas of uh, Mr. Winthrop's city on a hill, very much like the idea of manifest destiny, very much like the creation of a revelation, of, uh, not creation, I'm sorry, the construction of a revelation like Martin Luther's, and of course, John Calvin's. We came to understand that the Holy Spirit, and we are talking about Pentecostalism, has a particular language. Described in Acts 2.17 as dreams, visions, and prophecy. And we began to understand that when the Holy Spirit wants to talk to a person, he delivers a dream, or he sows a vision in his heart, or he delivers a prophetic word, and you can start from that prophetic element, building up, constructing the reality or social reality that we can inherit our children 
when one day we can see, say, like David, I served my generation. In 2000, Guatemala uh, experienced, I don't know how to say this, but an overflow of the prophetic element. The restoration of the fivefold ministry, God bringing up the awareness of uh, the body of Christ to the ministry of the apostle and the prophet came to understand about the prophet moving in that area or dimension that we call time while the apostle moves in the second dimension that we call space and the apostolic ministry recuperating, opening and occupying spaces in society that had been lost. In 2000, the Apostolic Council was established in Guatemala with some apostles, and uh, it has certainly marked a change, a difference in our society. Then we came to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and understood that spirit, soul, and body does not apply only to a person, but also to a society, or a community, or a city, or a nation, which of course are only conglomerates made of human beings. Spirit, soul, and body led us to understand that the powers in the spirit realm influence or develop a particular culture, an idiosyncrasy, that then determines the state of society. In the form of a worldview, in the form of a mindset, in the form of a mentality, or in the form of a culture. That's uh, when we came to the point of uh, starting to understand Matthew 28 and the concept of discipling nations. Concept like culture matters, and I'm thinking of course about Larry Harrison, and the Anglo-Protestant culture, and now I'm thinking about Samuel Huntington, and the British law system or legal system, thinking about David Little, wonderful people I have had the privilege of meeting and working with. And then the hero, Max Weber, and the idea that Protestantism can make a difference in a country that is so hurt by social maladies like my country has been for the last uh, 40 or 50 years, 36 years of civil war, uh, they speak about a thousand, a hundred thousand people killed, and so on and so forth. And then we arrive at 2003, September the 8th. The Holy Spirit speaks another prophetic word where he mentions that the old wineskin, that the old paradigm is finished. There's a new one in place, he says. I didn't have a clue. What, what is this new paradigm, new wineskin? We all have read, of course. The scripture and we have all read about wineskins and of course the contrast between the old and the new is a way to understand we come to understand the concept of liberty and freedom and not only that but responsibility that comes with freedom as Martin Luther used to preach and as Paul the Apostle wrote I am totally free of everyone but because I am free of everyone that's why I feel responsible enough to become a servant of all then the concept of contribution and the idea of the cultural mandate in Genesis 1.28, dominion, subdue, and then of course, second chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter 15. He decided to put man and woman, of course, in the Garden of Eden so they could keep it and cultivate it. So we have the first notion, the first appearance of the word culture. The cultural mandate and the idea of building a city, when we see the Bible that starts with a garden and ends with a city, and we come to understand that God is saying basically, I deliver unto you this land, this garden, and I expect you to deliver at the end of time a city unto my hands. We see man's attributes and talents, the image of God. Man needs always to release this creativity, this innovation. 
He needs to produce what we call, very broadly, culture. And this production will eventually lead us to what San Agustin called Civitas Dei, Civitas Mundi. There are two cities. One belongs to God and one belongs to the world. If we start to think about the city of sin, if I can call it that, like that, and we start to think about Cain and then Lamech and then Nimrod, we will eventually see that the Bible speaks about the great Babylon. But then there's a second city that I call the city of God, as St. Augustine did. And we think about the city of Abel, or you can call it the one of Abraham, or Moses, or David, or Jesus Christ. And we will end up having a wonderful city called the New Jerusalem. When we think about those two cities, when we think about a city, we think about a structure that is created or consists of systems. We cannot think about a city and only think about buildings and bridges and rivers and highways. We have to think about systems, economic systems, financial systems, legal systems, so on and so forth. But we think about these systems when we start to think about those systems, we start to talk about differences, very, very factual differences, like are we talking about free trade, or are we talking about fair trade? Are we talking about a just, a righteous system, or are we talking about an unrighteous system? Isn't it a paradox that Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico are probably the richest countries in the world? But at the very same time, they have some of the poorest peoples of the world. Isn't it amazing that Guatemala has such a fertile soil that can actually feed the whole Central America, maybe Latin America, but our people are dying because of hunger? I mean, isn't there something that is not working right? When we think about systems, we have to think about righteous and unrighteous systems. Distorted situations distorted by sin. Then we come to understand a little more about the new wine scheme versus the old. And I come to realize that it is basically a difference in the emphasis on scripture. In the old wine scheme, in Guatemala, I'm talking about the 70s and the 80s, probably the early 90s, the emphasis was made on the leaven of the world. Leaven understood as it has been in the Bible always as something which is dirty because it pollutes, because it ferments, because it is something that is mundane and worldly. Society that was not Christian was identified with the world and the world is under the evil one. It's dirty, it's worldly, it's mundane. What was the church's answer to that? The church's answer was to build up walls of separation to prevent pollution, to prevent, this was, <laughs> this was the most, how can I say, widely used word, contamination. Do not hear the music of the world or you will be contaminated. Do not watch the movies of the world, do not go to the university of the world, do not visit people who are worldly and so on and so forth. Let's build up the walls the sacred walls of the sanctuary to prevent the leaven of the world to come inside and reach us. So we became something totally separate from society and we became totally self-centered, very liturgic, experts in every facet of liturgy, wonderful praise, wonderful worship, wonderful preaching, wonderful uh, ministry inside the walls of the church that happened in my nation. The walls of separation were higher and higher, thicker and thicker. The church became self-centered and liturgy-oriented. We left society. The hardest part to admit is nobody put us out. We left voluntarily. We are the ones who left. We left education. It is still amazing to me 
that out of the first 187 universities that were studied in this country, 181 were studied by pastors and ministers. But then they were abandoned in a sense because we went to our building. Our scatology determined our social theory and the result was a separation. We abdicated our responsibility to society. In the new wineskin, the concept of leaven is redeemed by Jesus Christ in Matthew 13, 33, where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. All of a sudden, we start to emphasize a different scripture. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We have to go out to society. We have to break down those walls of separation and come out and bring the light onto the people. So there's a transition now happening from a self-centered church to a society-centered ministry. We quit acting by fear. In those days, we were afraid of uh, them contaminating us. All of a sudden now we are not afraid anymore. We want what we have inside to come unto them. We stop being only salt, preserving, preventing corruption, and becoming light, invading fearlessly darkness. That brings us to a level of engagement with society, and engaging society demands answers. What we call just, fair, or righteous systems must come from God's wisdom, from His Word or His words. Like a prophetic word, like this amazing word, Shalom. Psalm 85.10 says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. I share with Luis Lugo a tremendous admiration and love for a, a wonderful man by the name of Abraham Kuyper, who's, who challenges us even today with his most famous exclamation. There is not a single square inch in the universe which Jesus Christ does not exclaim sovereignty, saying, mine, mine, mine. The whole world is waiting this engagement. Now, the Guatemalan church faces a challenge to go back and I don't know if this word is right in English, by the way, reconquer, conquer again, redeem lost spaces in education, in schools and universities, in the media, TV, radio, the newspapers, social action, and of course, politics. Taking the normativity that we find in the Old Testament enriched by the experience of the New Testament to create those principles and values that must dictate morals and eventually be translated into public policy. An articulation of these principles is the challenge that Guatemala faces today. I wanted to finish by asking a question. What's the future challenge for Pentecostalism in Guatemala? And as I understand, the challenge is the articulation of a national vision. To have a national identity that comes from, as William Storer would say, acoustic ways, audible ways, based in words, in contrast of what it's called imagined communities based on images. Isn't it peculiar that Israel was asked not to have any images made while all its neighbors 
were putting all their hopes and all their attention exactly on images as today. As today is the case, when one refers to England or one refers to the motherland or one refers to the Eiffel Tower and so on and so forth. Israel was asked by God not to have any images. Where could Israel base its identity on but the word of the living word, God? And this is the case for Guatemala. This was the case for this great nation of America. A manifest destiny, a city upon a hill. Pentecostalism in Guatemala has now the challenge of discipling the nation through a Christian biblical worldview. The transmission of those values and principles I talked about a moment earlier. In order to permeate society, to reach that point expressed in Jeremiah 29 11, where he says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good and not of evil, to provide you with a future and a hope. Thank you very much. Mr. Caballeros, thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling too brief a story of your remarkable journey through the church and in your home country of Guatemala. There are many wiser people in this room who would have been able to tell me a while ago that if you put two passionate, powerful uh, Pentecostal preachers on the podium in the same evening, that you know what will happen is that you run out of time for anything else, which is the way I wanted it to happen. So the, the bad news, or maybe the good news, especially for some of our guests who have flown over from England and places far away, so it's way into the middle of the night right now, is that uh, we are going to wrap up our evening right now. The good news is that Pastor Caballeros and his wife will be with us for the rest of the conference. So all those questions that you're dying to answer I would like to ask the Caballeros is not to answer them tonight so you can come back tomorrow and have time with them. So um, I had now my notes uh, just to remind everyone that we will start tomorrow at the Davidson Conference Center. All right, so this is my test of USC directions up that way in the northeast corner of campus. Did I pass the test on? We have breakfast available at 745 and the sessions will start at uh, 830. For those of you who drive and know how to get here, parking is at gate four tomorrow. And uh, tonight, for those of you who are staying at the um, hotels in downtown, the shuttles will leave where they drop you off at 9.15 and at 9.25. So I apologize for ending a very wonderful evening on, on the logistics of it, but please give a, um, a wonderful hand to uh, Pastor Caballeros and hope you'll join us again tomorrow. Thank you. Oh. Good night.